The previous video discussed the procedure for choosing a statistical test, given the data that you have and the number of samples, the number of variables. It also discussed how to frame a null hypothesis to be tested. So now we'll cover the interpretation of the results, in particular something called the p-value. So the p-value is, I would say, a highly non-intuitive thing, and it's widely misused, so I'm going to do my best to be precise in this video as I describe things. We'll pick up from the point where you've chosen your null hypothesis and you've collected the data to test that hypothesis. So imagine the case where we want to know if there's a difference in grain size between two samples of sand, for example, the example I've used in, in the previous videos as well. Uh, well, we collect uh, two samples of sand grains and measure them and then calculate to the average size, the mean size, and, and compare the two. So remember that we're using the sample to estimate the population. Even if your samples are unbiased, I mean they're not deliberately higher or lower than the, the population, you'd still expect two samples to differ from each other to some degree just because they're randomly drawn from the population. So the main point of statistical hypothesis testing is to determine how likely your observations are if the null hypothesis is true. So basically how likely are your observations if in fact your two samples were independently drawn at random from the same population. Technically we're going to find the probability of observing an outcome at least as extreme as your result if the null hypothesis is true. So we don't care about your specific result, we care about something at least as extreme or unusual as your result. So one of the outputs from a statistical test is called the p-value. And the p-value is what I mentioned on the previous slide. Now we're just defining it. It's basically the probability of obtaining a result at least as extreme as the observed result if the null hypothesis is true. So the p-value is an important part of the decision process in this type of statistical hypothesis testing. For example, if the two samples did in fact come from the same population, that's our null hypothesis. So if our null hypothesis is true, the two samples did actually come from the same population. So given that, what is the probability of observing a difference in means at least as big as the one we did observe? So note that the p-value is not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. So that's an extremely important point. It's the probability of, of observing your result if the null hypothesis is true. So it's basically the probability of observing data. It's not the probability of the hypothesis being true. However, even though the p-value is not the probability that the null hypothesis is true, it does tell you something indirectly, qualitatively, about how likely that null hypothesis might be. If the probability of observing the data is extremely small, then it suggests that the null hypothesis is perhaps not that likely to be true. But remember, the p-value is not the probability that the null hypothesis is true, it's also not the probability that the result occurred by chance. So the p-value is just a probability. On its own, it doesn't allow you to make any decisions. You need to pair the p-value with some predetermined significance level called alpha. So alpha is the threshold, and if the p-value is lower, to, lower than or equal to that threshold, we can conclude that the null hypothesis is unlikely enough that we can reject it. So remember that the p-value, again, is the probability of observing an outcome at least as extreme as your result in the case where the null hypothesis was, in fact, true. But what level should we choose for alpha? And what are the implications of that choice? Well, consider this, this matrix here. It has two rows. The two rows labeled in blue on the left indicate the two possible states of reality. Although we don't know which is the case and we can't know which is the case, the null hypothesis in reality is either true or it's not true. Again, we don't know which of those it is. The columns, the two columns labeled in black at the top, are the two possible decisions that we can make given the p-value from our test. We can either decide to reject the null hypothesis. Um, we would do that if the p-value is smaller than or equal to alpha. Or we can decide that we're unable to reject the null hypothesis. So note that I, can, I didn't say accept it. So we can never actually accept or prove the null hypothesis. We just fail to reject it at a particular significance level. So two of the possibilities end up correctly reflecting reality. So if we make those choices under those circumstances, we are correct. Um, but the other two are erroneous conclusions. 
So if we set the alpha to be really high, let's say I'm going to reject the p-value if alpha is less than 0.5. If there's less than a 50% chance of observing the data that we got if the null hypothesis is true. So if we set alpha to be large, we can reject the null hypothesis for lots of different p-values. If the p-value is 0.4, we can reject it. If the p-value is 0.3 or, or whatever. So in doing so, we would be more likely to reject the null hypothesis when it was in fact true. And that's called a type 1 error here. So we might be correct, but if we set our alpha to be really high, the chance that we're going to commit this type 1 error is bigger. In contrast, we could be extremely strict and we say, okay, I'm only going to reject the null hypothesis when the probability of observing the results is extremely small. We'll say, I'm going to say the alpha is 0 0.0001. In that case, it should be really hard to reject the null hypothesis uh, in which we might be committing a type 2 error. So type 2 error basically means that you know, we did not correctly reject the null hypothesis. So in that case, we're going to reduce our chance of discovering truly significant results, really. So there's a lot of interesting history behind this, but to make a long story short, the completely arbitrary yet conventional choice for the significance level is alpha. Is alpha is 0 0.05. So this alpha, again, corresponds to the type 1 error rate, but I want to emphasize an important point. So if we set the significance level alpha, the type 1 error rate, to 0 0.05, that does not mean that 5% of our tests will be false positives, and it definitely doesn't mean that 5% of our significant results will be false positives. So actually, and this is a little complicated, but I, I will link, uh, link to a a website that explains it in more detail, um, the proportion of significant findings that you say are significant because P is less than alpha, the proportion of those that are actually false discoveries is a function not only of the significance level alpha, but also of the power that your test has to find results and of the probability that the effect you're looking for is even real in the first place. So keeping that all in mind, the, first, the final step is to compare your results, particularly the p-value, to your chosen significance level alpha, which is 0 0.05 by tradition. So this means that you would reject the null hypothesis if the probability of observing results at least as extreme as your own findings is 0.05 or 5% or less. So if you reject the null hypothesis, we, we will say that the difference between samples, or whatever you're testing for, is statistically significant. Note that we can never prove or accept the null hypothesis. We, if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, it's not correct to say that the samples are the same. You should only say that there's no significant difference. So your, your, your comparison is either significantly different or not significantly different. You can never say that they're the same. Two final important notes. First, this process that we've outlined in this video and then before for statistical hypothesis testing is valid for testing a single hypothesis that you proposed before you looked at your data. So you should never, never try multiple paths to get to a result. You should never try different permutations of the data. You should never try excluding and including things. Uh, you should never run multiple tests unless you're reporting that you're doing that. So more, more on that in future videos. Basically, if you run multiple tests, if you sort of dredge through your data trying to find things, there's the overall chance that you're going to find something that is a type 1 error, that you're going to find one of these false positives or false discoveries is increased potentially a lot. And finally, it's important to note that statistical significance just tells you the probability that the effect exists. The probability of observing an effect at least as large as you did if the null hypothesis is true. It says nothing about the importance of the effect itself. So you need to look at the size of the actual effect, the size of the difference between samples, or the strength of the relationship or whatever, and use your own judgment to determine whether that would be important in the real world. Statistical significance is a function both of the size of the effect, but also the sample size that you're working with. So tiny differences between groups can end up being statistically significant if you have a large sample size, even though they might not be meaningful in a real-world sense.